1 Corinthians chapter number 3 this morning. If you found your place, let's all stand. I won't be long this morning. I know we got a baptism and all that good stuff. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. All right, look there at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 1. Notice what the Bible says. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye yet not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who then is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. I want to draw your attention back to verse number 2, 1 and 2, and really verse number 3, where it says that Paul calls them carnal, he calls them babes, and notice he begins to rebuke them over how they're acting within the church. I want to preach to you this morning on this thought. I want to preach to you this morning on the thought, the creation of a Corinthian catastrophe. The creation of a Corinthian catastrophe. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church this morning. God, I pray you bless our time here together as we study your book. And Lord, I pray that you help me as I preach. We love you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I want you to notice a few things here. Of course, the Corinthian church, the longest epistles that Paul have are the first is 1 Corinthians 16 chapters and then you got 2 Corinthians it's the only uh, it's the only um, uh, uh, books here two books that goes into as much information as far as church polity in my opinion <clears throat> than any other of the Pauline epistles um, the Corinthian letters are meant to straighten out a carnal church of course you understand the church of Corinth was one of the most carnal churches that existed in the New Testament. In fact, it could be argued that the most carnal church that Paul dealt with in his ministry was the Corinthian church. That's why I've always marveled, and I'm not trying to be ugly this morning, but I've always marveled why churches are called like Corinth Baptist Church. Um, there, there's a, I'm, I'm honest, I'm not saying they're bad churches or anything. I'm just saying my, uh, on the way up there where my wife lives, I, we pass the church on the way up to or where her parents now live, where she used to live. Uh, the scandal is me and my wife are separated right now, no. Um, but where her parents live, uh, you, we pass, it's called Corinth Baptist Church. And I, I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about the church. I know nothing about them. But it's just always struck me as funny that you'd name a church literally after the most carnal church in the New Testament. More problems in the Corinthian church than any other church. We find here, we could, take, we could go through a two-month-long series going through all the different problems that Paul addresses in the Corinthian church. Of course, we understand that one of the problems was fornication in chapter number 5. We understand that another problem was in chapter number 6, they were taking each other to court. We understand one of the problems in chapter number 7 was the law of divorce and what constitutes divorce and who can get remarried after divorce and all that. In chapter 8, he deals with the idea of eating meat, sacrificed to idols. In chapter 9, he deals with giving. In chapter 10, uh, he deals with uh, uh, using the Jews in the Old Testament as an example. And all that kind of, and on and on the list goes. In chapter number 11, he deals with the home and the woman and the, pl the place of the woman and the man and God and all that kind of stuff. Of course, in chapters 12 through 13, or excuse me, chapters 12 through 14, he deals with the matter of speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of problems that the Apostle Paul is addressing in the Corinthian church. But there's three things here specifically found in chapter 3 that I want to deal with you. First of all, I want you to notice about these Corinthians. First of all, I want you to notice that they were carnal. They were carnal. 
understand one of the problems that Paul dealt with in the Corinthian church was carnality. Now listen, I'm not aiming at anybody. I, I don't, I, there was nobody in mind that I had for this message. So if something hits you between the eyes, know that that's just the arrows of the Almighty that are just falling and the Lord's directing the arrows. So if something hits you this morning, then just get down here on the altar and get right about it. Amen. But they were carnal. Now, when we use that word carnal, what that means is, is that means it's of the flesh. It's fleshly. That's where we get the word carnival from. Comes, in fact, the Spanish word for meat, for flesh, is carne. Carne asada. That just means flesh. It means meat. It's a Latinized word. So understand, when we say carnal, that does not mean that somebody's lost. It doesn't mean they're going to hell. But when we say a Christian is acting carnal, that means that they are acting after the flesh and not after the Spirit. Notice Paul says, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. You know what one of the biggest problems that plagues our churches today is carnality. We look like the world, we act like the world, we dress like the world, we talk like the world. It is absolutely unbelievable how much of the world has crept into the church. We have thought that by being more like the world, we could win the world. But folks, you cannot take the things of the world to attract the world away from the world. You have to use the things of God to attract people to the things of God away from the world. It is amazing how Christianity has gotten to such a point where we have members that are so carnal. I mean, just so fleshly. I mean, it, it, is, it is no thought. Uh, now you have people that don't even think about it. They just shack up now. I mean, not even, no thought given. No shame in it at all. Just, just shack up, hook up. It doesn't matter. Who cares? We're in this... I, I, I even have Christian people that say, well, 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 well they're, they're, it's not like they're teenagers. They're grown people. It doesn't matter if you're 18 or 80. Fornication is still wrong. Having, having premarital relations is still wrong according to the Bible. It doesn't matter how old you are. And the fact that we have Christian people that justify that shows the carnality. The fact that we have Christians that justify the things they do. Well, it's all right. I can, I can do this. There's nothing wrong with any of this. Uh, I can go out and, 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 and drink my beer. And I can go out here and, and I, can, I can party and live like the world. It's carnal. It's amazing how much carnality has slipped in the church. Now, we don't have a problem with it here, so don't think I'm trying to address anything. We don't have a problem with it here. But it's amazing how Christian young people, how we're allowing our Christian young people to live and act today. Well, I'm telling you what, towards the end of the year, the end of the year, I, I, our school's almost out yet. I know my boys are out now. But the whole school's almost out. You know what you get when you get to the end of the school year and it starts warming up? You start getting all these schools that are doing these dances and proms. Don't get quiet on me now. And they send their young people off to the dances and, and let these girls dress in cocktail dresses. Amen. These short, short skirts that reveal everything, reveal the legs. And I mean, they're wearing barely enough clothes on to clean a shotgun out. And they let them go. And these boys will pick them up. And they'll go to these dances where they're bumping all this music and letting those boys and girls dance and rub all over each other. It's out of hell. It's wicked. And if you let a young person go to that, then you're wicked for letting them do it. I don't care what anybody says. You can like it or lump it. I've been preaching this for years. Now, again, I don't, I don't know if we got a problem with it. I, if, if, you, if, if, if this is going on, I have no idea about it. I'm not trying to address anything. I'm just giving you an example of where the carnality... And then all of a sudden, you got these mamas and daddies that'll post their girls dressing like night walkers, amen, street walkers, and they'll get out there and they'll post these pictures and say, my little girl's going to prom, 13, 14 years old, dressed like that, letting them go out with a boy. That's the epitome of carnality and stupidity. Amen. Letting them go, listen to all that filthy music and doing all this stuff. It's absolutely out of hell and I'll stand against it and preach against it until the day I die. Amen. Man, brother Slater, I'm starting to figure out why the church ain't growing more. Yeah, <laughs> you're starting to figure it out, man. It's wicked. And I don't care who allows it. I don't, care, I don't care how innocent you think it is. There's nothing innocent. We're letting young people get out there and dance and bump all over each other. So well, there's nothing wrong with all that dance. Listen, I'm telling you, I'm telling you how old-fashioned I am, man. I'm, I'm, sh I'm showing, showing my true colors this morning, I guess. You say, there's nothing wrong with all that dancing. 
Oh, let me ask you a question. There's nothing sexual about dancing. Oh, let me ask you a question. If you were to walk into a room and all of a sudden see me and Brother Darren dancing together, what would you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You say, man, those two guys are gay. Those are queers. And then you say, man, I've never seen four left feet in a room before. <laughs> <clears throat> Don't you dare sit there and tell me there's nothing sexual about dancing. If you were to walk into a bunch of men dancing together, you'd think they's all queer. Understand, there's something about it. That's what, Listen, that's why young people shouldn't be holding hands and doing all that stuff before they get married. Oh, preacher, that is so old-fashioned. You can call it old-fashioned if you want to, but I'll, it'll be a cold day where the boogeyman lives. Now listen, whatever your young people want to do, we're at, and again, I'm not trying to address anything. You say, preacher, who are you shooting? I ain't shooting at nobody. I'm just trying to show you where carnality shows up. You say, well, preacher, uh, what's, wrong with, what's wrong with young people kissing, you know, giving your first kiss and all that? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, now concerning the things where you're written unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And you've got all these young people People want to lay up all over each other and hold up hands and all this kind of stuff. I had a lady come up to me one time and said, I don't think you ought to fuss at the young people. I mean, it was in this building. She said, I don't think you ought to fuss at the young people for holding hands in church. I said, I'm not going to listen. I'm not pastoring a church where all the young people lay up all over each other. They're not married and they want to hold hands. You can do that wherever you want to, but you ain't doing it here, man. Amen. Everybody all right this morning? It's this, it's this antibiotic. The antibiotic's frying my brain, I think. I'm, it's carnality. I remember we, uh, somebody wanted to have a wedding at our church. Not this one, but the old one. I said, that's fine, absolutely. I was going to do the wedding. No problems at all. And they were down there. They were getting some of the stuff together downstairs and uh, setting up some of the tables and everything. And they had them all set up kind of weirdly. They had a big space right there in the middle of all the tables. And I said, y'all can set tables up here. I mean, we're, you, you got, oh, well, we're leaving that open. We're leaving that open for the, uh, in, in case, in case uh, they want to have a father-daughter dance, in case anybody wants to dance after the reception. And I, I was nice about it. I wasn't a jerk. I said, uh, we don't allow dancing here. You, you don't allow dancing after the wedding? No, 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 no dancing. No dancing. And you know what they did? They went ahead and set up tables in the middle of the dance floor. You say, Brother Sue, what if somebody wanted to use the church building and want to have a dance afterwards here? Oh, they can have the church building. We, we can let them get married here. I'll marry them, no problem. They're not gonna have, we're not going we're not going to take out the chairs downstairs and set up a dance floor. Amen, amen. 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 We're not, well, what if somebody wanted to have a reception with some alcohol? We're not doing that here. Amen. Amen. I won't even I won't even marry a couple. I will not even perform the wedding ceremony if I know there's going to be drinking and dancing at the wedding. One time, some people slipped it in on me. But I asked them, man, I'll straight up ask, it's going to be any dancing or alcohol at the way. You say, preacher, this, you are just, I can't vote. You can say whatever you want to, man. I'm telling you, the carnality has slipped into our churches. And now what used to be sin 75 years ago is now not even a blink in the eye of Christians anymore. <coughs> churches that'll set up all this stuff and have all these activities and get girls up on stage wearing short shorts and these guys will get up there in their tank tops and t-shirts. I'm telling you, carnality has slipped into our churches. But not only were they carnal... And by the way, you know what the church ought to strive to do? The church ought to strive to be as much like the Lord and as much away from the world as we possibly can. Amen. But not only that, not only were they carnal, but notice, number two, not only were they carnal, they were childish. They were childish. He says, I've desired to speak to you as in spiritual, but I have to talk to you as unto carnal, even as what? Unto babes in Christ. He said, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to talk to you like some grown men. The problem is you're acting like a bunch of babies. You're acting childish. You know what the problem, you know what the problem with babies are? I love little babies. I love little babies. Gosh, there was a little five-month-old baby at the youth camp. There was a couple had a baby. And I was holding that baby. And they said, Brother Sir, don't you want another one? And I said, No. I, I said, I like holding this one. I said, you know what I love about, about little babies right now? I can hold little babies, and then if they need a diaper change, I can hand them right back. Ah, uh, yeah. I, uh, I, I love little babies. I really do. I like holding babies. I just, there's just something so 
wonderful about a pure, innocent little child. I just, I just love it. They're just sweet. There's something comforting about holding a baby. I just, I love babies. Here's the thing, though. I like holding babies. I don't like pastoring them. Amen. 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 I like holding babies. I don't like pastoring them. You know what happens when you try to give a steak to a baby? It gets choked. Now here's the thing. I'm not talking about somebody who's just been saved two or three weeks, just got born again, never been in church. I'm talking about people that have been in church their whole lives, been saved for 25, 30, 45, 50 years, and yet they still act like a child. That's where the problem comes into. When you have a child and it's seven years old and it's still 45 pounds and hadn't grown any, you take that child to the doctor and you begin to say, why isn't this child growing? There's something wrong with it. Why aren't we asking the same things when it comes to the Christian life? Man, that person's been saved for 35 years and yet they have not grown in their Christian life at all. Something is wrong. <clears throat> there is a growth hindrance somewhere. They act like a child. You know what happens? You know what happens when a baby doesn't get their way? Number one, a baby can't eat. It can't eat strong meat because it's a baby. But number two, you know what happens when a baby doesn't get its way? Pitches a fit. Oh man, I have seen some church babies in my time, some church toddlers. Well, they didn't get their way, and they just absolutely pitched a t total. Fit. You know what that is? That's carnal and that's childish and that's the making, that's the creation of a Corinthian catastrophe. Let me say this. Nobody has the preeminence in any church or nobody should have the preeminence in any church except the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. What matters is what does the Bible say, right? And I've, I've seen, listen, I've pastored some absolute children in the past. I, I don't like them. I don't like this. I don't like that. I, I'm, I'm mad about this. I'm mad about that. I'm not coming. I'm this. I'm that. Listen, you know what? You know, you know the best way to handle a toddler that's throwing a temper tantrum? Just let them pitch a fit all they want to. You done? Yeah, I'm done. Am I going to get in my way? No. You know what happens when you ignore a toddler enough Eventually, they realize that pitching a fit ain't going to get them their way. And you know, when they're small, you may have to also add some of that, uh, you know, apply the uh, rod of correction to the seat of learning. Amen. But you know how you handle church babies? You say, Preacher Bo Sluder, what happens when, well, how do you handle church babies? How do you handle children in the church that want to pitch a fit? And, and you know what I do? I just ignore them. Well, I don't like this. Okay. You have every right not to like it. In fact, you can like it and still love the Lord. But just because you don't like something does not mean I have to change it. Amen. Just because somebody doesn't like the way it's... So, who cares? The creation of a Corinthian catastrophe. I've, I've seen people... Listen, you better pay real close attention to how people act and how people respond and how people do in church situations because I promise you... They're not acting that way just at church. In fact, nine times out of ten, the symptoms that pop up at church are much, much deeper at home. I've noticed that in the Christian life. I've noticed that pastoring people. I'm not an expert in pastoring, but I've been pastoring this church now for almost ten years. I've been pastoring collectively now for almost 14 years. I think I've seen a thing or two. When people began to get bitter and sour and get away from God, you know what starts happening? I'm going to tell you what happens when people start getting sour with the Lord. See, they never want to say, nobody hardly ever says, well, I'm not right with God. But I'm going to give you some of the symptoms of when somebody's truly not right with God. They begin to blame everybody else for their problems. It's everybody else's fault. Well, no, I'm not out of church because I'm backslidden. I'm out of church because I didn't like something the preacher said. Or I didn't like what that member did. Or I didn't like how this happened. I didn't like how that happened. I'm not coming. I'm not going there anymore. Oh, well, I'm just going to stay away for a while. Whatever it may be, A, B, C, or D, pick whatever it is. But understand, the reason why people get backslidden on God is never, ever, ever because of other people. 
It is always because they themselves backslid and they want to push the blame on somebody else. It's the blame game. And what happens is, is not only do they try to blame everybody else, but they begin to take a superior attitude. Well, I just know better than everybody. I just, I just, I, I, I know how things really ought to be. I'm the one, I'm the expert in all things. I, I know how it should be done. All right, if you know how it should be done, then go down the road, you start a church, and you show, show everybody else how to do it. Now, again, I'm not firing anybody. We're not having any problems, but an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? And as the church is growing and as we begin to get more people and as God begins to do things, you better hear me and hear me well. The devil's going to try to get in here somehow. The devil, undoubtedly, there's no question in my mind, as we're growing, as people are getting saved, we're getting the devil's attention, and I promise you, he will take notice and he will try to slip in somehow. Not only were they carnal, but they were childish. But not only that, notice they were contentious. Notice in verse number 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And the problem was, is there was some in the Corinthian church saying, Well, I'm, I was baptized of Apollos, and I, or I was baptized of Paul, and I was this. And, well, you know, my standing, well, this is how I think. This is, what I, this is my opinion. All, and notice Paul says it doesn't matter who you're baptized of. It doesn't matter who won you to the Lord. Some planted, some watered, but it's God that gives the increase. And you better listen to me very closely. You better be careful when people start come in here and they start acting contentious. Well, what do you think about that? What do you think? How do you? I, I just don't know about that. Well, I'm going to tell you what I think. Here's my opinion. You better be careful about people like that because what happens is, is they'll try to come in here and they'll try to start drawing people away and they'll try to start slipping ideas in your mind. And next thing you know, they're wanting you to turn against the pastor. Next thing you know, they're wanting you to leave the church. And next thing you know, at that same church that loved you and prayed for you and took care of you and you, you just thought, man, I can't believe how wonderful this church is. All of a sudden, because somebody else is sour, what happens is they begin to turn you sour. And next thing you know, you're out of here because somebody was able to talk you into leaving the church that loved you. And that, listen, that family or that person never did anything for you. It wasn't them you called when your husband left or your wife left or your kids were out, 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 out running wild. That's not the person you called. It was the pastor. It was the church. You better be careful about people that want to come in and start causing contentions and what we call clicks. They were clickish. Somebody said, Brother Sluter, uh, what, uh, what kind of youth activities do you do? And I said, brother, I said, I said well, our church does activities, but really there's not any youth activities we do. When we do something, if there's, if there's an activity at the church, it's for anybody that wants to come. Amen. What about the youth group? What do you mean youth group? We, we've, we've got young people in our church but they're, they're just they're the young people in the church. It's not a, I'm not pastoring a church within a church. I'm not hiring a youth pastor to come in here and pastor a church within this church. We're not, we're not, listen, you know what we are? We are the body of Christ. We are the church. We all are in the church. There's not one church for the young people and another church for the old people and another church for the young. Listen, that's why I strive when we have an activity here. I mean, you know, unless it's, you know, something that's absolutely specifically designed for young people. You know, if we were to ever go to a water park, I don't know if we'd want to take some of the older. I don't know if Miss Nancy would fit in at the water park, amen? I'm not sure that'd be age appropriate for Miss Nancy, but you get the idea. When we have an activity here at the church, we don't have a Valentine's banquet and then have this group or that group. We don't have different activities for this group or that. We are the church. And what happens is, is when you begin to get these things, and as you get these bigger ministries, and I'm not against getting bigger, but you understand what I mean. When you begin to get all these different organizations and different ministries and different this, well, I'm over this and I'm over that and I'm over this. And I'm over... What happens is, is people begin to build their own little kingdoms within the church. 
And next thing you know, it's all about this group or that group or this Sunday school class or that Sunday school class or it's all about this ministry. Well, I'm trying to start this, but nobody wants to do this and everybody's so focused in. And what happens is, is the church begins to lose sight of what our true purpose is. Our true purpose is to not create a bunch of ministries trying to get people in through ministries. Our purpose is to try to get people in through the preaching and teaching of God's Word. That's the purpose of the church, to win people to the Lord, to evangelize, to disciple them, and to send them out to do the same thing. That's the purpose of the church. And what happens is you begin to get these cliques and you begin to get these people that want to get their little group and have their little power group and their little control group and I'm the leader of this group and then I'm the leader. And what happens is is it begins to create divisions in the church and next thing you know we've got a full-blown Corinthian catastrophe. Next thing you know the church is fighting and can't get along. I'm here to tell you folks by the grace of God I want that to happen here. It's not happening. Do you know what I want? I want a church that strives to love one another and pray for one another. And I want a church that strives to serve the Lord and please the Lord. And you better be careful about folks that will try to endeavor to break that bond of unity. You better be careful about folks that are childish and immature and seek to cause division and strife and seek to try to turn you away from the Lord and turn you away from the church. You better be careful about folks like that. Again, an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. I promise it's coming. It's inevitable. The devil can't stand what's going on here. He'll try everything in his power to destroy it. 